So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dan, and um, I would like to thank everybody for joining our session for Travelers Protection Guide. I'm here joined by Marco, which is director of uh, Great Europe in Kaspersky. Hello. Um, also, welcome from my side. Um, Dan and me, we're um, part of Great at Kaspersky. And just a very brief overview, Kaspersky Great is a very elite team of uh, researchers. Um, we're doing highly advanced investigations and analysis into threats. Um, that's our main profession. And throughout our um, almost 11 years, it's been 11 years, Marcos, no? Yeah. Like since we started, um, our team was started. We visited, we went through a lot of conferences, we had a lot of travel. And due to um, this requirement, we had to devise a set of uh, OPSEC, um, OPSEC um, practices, best practices for our travels. This was due to the fact that we had sometimes to protect our digital assets, and uh, sometimes we had to protect our physical assets as well. So throughout, throughout our presentation today, hopefully you will see some, um, you will hear some um, interesting um, tips and tricks how to improve your OPSEC for the, um, your future uh, travels or for um, um, any, any new uh, device you might be getting. So let's start. I would say that um, a very famous person, um, mentioned like a long time ago and um, he said the following that if you know the enemy you and if you know yourself you can win almost any on any battle and that is like um, I think it applies to uh, today uh, today's info war as well but also very uh, another famous person said something um, <clears throat> interesting as well and um, Marco says that when you're in uh, defense and somebody is trying to actively attack you, then you have to make only one mistake. And when you do that, they own you. It's game over. Now, the problem is, is that they can do as many mistakes as possible when they are in the offense stage. But when you're defending yourself, you have to be very, very careful. And that's why th this is what we're gonna talk um, today about. And our presentation is gonna be split into two parts. I'm gonna be talking about the digital part of your, uh, protecting your digital side of your devices. And then Mark is gonna talk about protecting your physical uh, realm. And let's start about what we know based on our, based on our um, 11 years of experience from um, various kinds of attacks and revelations. We know that internet traffic might and is monitored, whether if it's um, metadata that is co being collected or actual traffic that is being uh, recorded like uh, for uh, later inspection whether if it's like a deep packet inspection or like um, light monitoring, internal traffic might be logged. Log. So the moment your traffic leaves your own network, you don't control it anymore. Somebody else, the ISP, uh, the, the provider, the upstream provider, they control it. They handle it, your traffic and you don't know what's, what's happening with it. Also, your all your communications can be intercep intercepted and stored, whether if there are like phone calls or like uh, messages or photos or like uh, text messages, they might, be um, they might be stored. Voice calls as well. And there are not a few cases, we've seen, um, we've seen some cases within um, our company as well, uh, where laptops were seized at borders also um, you can see you, you, there were a lot of um, instances in the past where digital, digital devices or devices holding digital data were stolen from hotel rooms, whether if it's your laptop or whether if it's your mobile phone, 
burglars or, or attackers had access to um, somehow managed to get access to, your, to hotel rooms, and then they managed to steal those devices. And ultimately, in order to gain access or to um, steal data, computers and, and servers were hacked, and then um, malware deployed on those ones, whether if it's like a watering hole attack or direct um, network penetration in order to gain access to sensitive data. So in order to do that, we've devised a set of um, minimum OPSEC rules. Of course, those are not the only rules that we are following, but those, are, th those should be the ones that would help you and can help you kickstart your OPSEC, um, OPSEC um, practices, best practices. And we start with the operating system. Nowadays, most of you travel with a laptop and um, <clears throat> this laptop, maybe it's uh, provided by the company or maybe it's your own personal laptop. Now it's very important that the data stored on, on, uh, on your hard drive, whether it's an SSD or an M2 device or like hopefully a not anymore a spinning disk, this data needs to be encrypted. Because, and as, as I mentioned before, if your um, laptop gets stolen, then the data is at risk. So what can you use? Some SSD vendors, they offer um, encryption, but you have to be really careful um, not, to, um, not to be confused with uh, only lock options. So you have to be very careful that um, the encryption offered by the SSD is real, um, real one. So because of that, we actually prefer to use software encryption. Whether you use Linux or Mac, or, sorry, whether you use Windows or Mac OS, then for those two operating systems, you have an option, a built-in option in the operating system to encrypt your, uh, um, your drives. And it's called BitLocker in Windows and FileVault in Mac OS. If you're, running, if you're um, uh, running GNU Linux or uh, any other Linux variant, you have Linux Unified Key Setup, Linux, which is pretty, pretty uh, it's good, it's stable. Um, it offers exactly the same protection at, as the, the two technologies that I mentioned before, and it's open source. So that's pretty cool. If you don't want to use any of these, uh, especially if you're on Windows, you can also use VeraCrypt, which VeraCrypt is, um, <clears throat> comes from TrueCrypt, and VeraCrypt has been um, multiple times has been verified from, with a thorough security audit, and uh, they have the, the source, uh, the entire source code open sourced, and they are pretty good. We recommend them. And um, the advantage of using VeraCrypt is that they can also provide you a plausible deniability, which uh, it's a function documented by VeraCrypt by using encrypted um, containers, hidden and hidden containers, and you can find out more about this in their help. Okay, so let's assume your operating system is secure and that you um, at least have some, um, some physical protections in case of uh, theft. What about your communication? What about your... Um, um, data that you receive and send to other parties, whether it may be your colleagues or your family members or your partners. Well, on average, um, one person sends and receives, sorry, sends up to 30, 40 emails per day on average. Sometimes I have uh, days where I, I send like only one or two, or sometimes I send, uh, I send uh, more than that. We communicate using email. And the problem is that once your email um, e inbox is um, Ill like illegally accessed or like unauthorized access, then an attacker has access to all your emails. That's why it's very important and we strongly recommend that you use uh, GPG to encrypt all your, um, all your uh, email communications. And it's not hard to do it. There are a lot of programs and most email clients are um, actually compatible with the GPG standard. And um, they allow you to encrypt, uh, to send and um, all sent or and all received emails, you can decrypt them. But there's a catch. If you're using RSA, RSA keys to encrypt your emails, 
be careful to only use uh, 4K uh, bit keys. Um, keys which are like 1024 uh, bits or like 2048 bit keys, they, we don't know for sure, but there are rumors that they can be cracked. So keep, keep your keys safe. That's very important and change your keys regularly. You can do this one by using a token, using a security token. So instead of your key being stored on a, on a laptop, on your laptop, on your operating system, um, your RSA private key can be stored or a security token, which has special functions. And I will uh, talk about security, to security tokens a little bit later in, um, in a few slides. The real danger in um, <clears throat> having your key stolen is that if an attacker has access to your private key and your decryption passphrase for your private key, then that attacker has access to all your previous conversations. That's really important. And by the way, if you wanna ask us um, something, if you wanna chat with us, we are here, we are on the chat. We're happy to answer any of your questions. And please ping us if you have any questions. We are gonna. Um, we are here. We can answer them in no time. Okay. So we talked about email, but you know sometimes email is not enough. Sometimes emails are slow, and you want to get a hold of that person pretty fast. So we, in our team, we are using uh, text messages. We're using voice um, nowadays with this uh, entire pandemic. Um, like uh, work from home is like uh, the new norm. And um, we are using tools which allow us to be virtually in the same room. So what can you use in, in order to make sure that your communications are secure? Well, we recommend, and maybe you might have heard um, some, one popular solution, which is Signal. And um, Signal became quite popular um, also uh, after uh, Elon Musk tweeted about it, uh, use Signal, and um, also became popular when a lot of uh, WhatsApp users um, migrated from WhatsApp to Signal. But we also recommend Trima, if you never heard about it. Um, what's interesting about Trima compared to Signal is that Trima doesn't require a phone number in order to create an account. You're not bound, you're not legally connect, um, you're not legally um, <clears throat> connected or um, you're not stuck with a phone number. If you want to create a new Trima account, you just remove the old one and you create a new one, which is something that is not very easy to do on Signal. So it's pretty cool. Session is another, another um, app, which is pretty interesting, as well as Wire. And props to once uh, to you, if you recognize the Ricochet um, logo from the top left. Ricochet is pretty awesome because it uses Tor in order to, um, to like um, <coughs> talk to other users. Jitsi Meet is also something that we recommend and it's pretty useful because it allows you to set up your own server in your own infrastructure, in your own cloud. So that's pretty cool. Okay, now you're using all these kind of products. But what about your connection to the internet? What, um, what should you use if you're in a public cafe or if you're in your hotel room using the hotel's Wi-Fi? Sometimes it's not a good idea to use an untrusted network. And because of that, we recommend running, um, uh, setting up a VPN provider. Now, you might ask ourselves, hey, um, what VPN provider should I use? Like, um, then what do you use? Like, and my answer is I use multiple ones, but um, we recommend, and we dropped the link, which you can see it in the bottom of, bottom of our slide, uh, safety, from Safety Detectives. They have a good comparison for the best VPN uh, providers that you should use, and you should decide for yourself. But you have to be careful that you shouldn't use a VPN provider, which is free, because, um, when something, when something is free, which is a rule for like everything in life, then you are the product. So choose something that you pay a little for, for the services and you know that it's pretty strong and pretty capable. Now, as I mentioned that we should be using security tokens. Those are like small keys, 
which uh, can uh, do some crypto cryptographic functions um, on behalf for you. And the advantage of um, those keys is that they are um, they are enclosed and um, an attacker, even if, they, if uh, the attacker, they compromise your computer, they can only, in, they cannot access your private key stored on the security token. They can, also, they can only use the security token in order to do some functions, but you can protect yourself by enabling touch option in the security key. And there are multiple vendors, multiple security keys, but um, I think the last one that we tested were um, YubiKeys. And um, I think, um, Marco, I think you used the um, Nano uh, YubiKey. How was it? Was it good? Yeah, it's quite awesome, but uh, be aware that you need a, a, a USB uh, slot usually. That's at least what I do. Yeah, and basically it, um, you trade one USB port, you just insert it into your laptop and you keep it with you all the time. Well, assuming that most laptops have two USB ports or three, I think that's okay, you know? I think that's, that's pretty a good trade-off. So uh, research, uh, we dropped the links to uh, we dropped links to three vendors for uh, security tokens, and do your own research. But please use security tokens because they are uh, they are useful for when um, to protect your accounts for two-factor authentication, and two-factor is really important, uh, and we will discuss it in the next slide. But it's something that I want to um, <clears throat> I want to like make you extremely aware of is that no matter how many um, protections you develop, how many antiviruses you have on your computer, like uh, how many VPN lines, um, you have like the most secure device ever in the world. If you're talking to a source over like the most, the most secure channel ever, if I, like hypothetically, the most secure channel ever, if the receiving party is compromised, then the data you are, you are sending to the receiving party is also compromised. So it's very important to understand that not only your device needs to be secure, but also your receiving party device needs to be secure. And the reason you should also deploy those OPSEC tricks, OPSEC tricks are not only for your protection, but also for your party's protection as well. And lastly, as I mentioned, um, two-factor authentication, I think that since we are at um, <clears throat> online security conference, we are at, at RSA conference, there are multiple vendors providing two-factor authentication uh, schemes, um, and you should enable two-factor whenever possible. Most online accounts nowadays, they offer two-factor authentication. You can enable two-factor authentication on your SSH sessions whenever you're administrating servers. You can enable it almost everywhere. So it's very important to do that, to use um, security, to security token, security keys to, uh, to achieve this goal. And it's also important to mix and match, use different email addresses for different types of sensitive data and have a plan. In case you get hacked, ask yourself right now, like, or tomorrow, or when you go to bed, like, what happens if I get hacked? If, what happens if attackers get access to my email address? What happens if attackers get access to my account, um, domain account, which is also an administrator in the uh, Active Direct on, on the Active Directory server or my, um, in my company? What would happen there? Have a plan. And remember that all the trips and ticks that I, meant, I showed you today is not because we want to hide from somebody. We want to prevent abuse of information. We want um, to make sure that if something happens, there are other um, security mechanisms in place to protect against this attack. And with this being said, uh, hopefully, um, I hope, you had like, um, <clears throat> you found some interesting uh, tips and tricks from my side, uh, tips and tricks about the digital realm. And now um, I will pass the microphone to Marco to talk to you about uh, tips and tricks for the physical realm. Thanks, Dan. 
Right. After all the more um, digital side of things, let's get uh, physical. And especially while traveling, there is one common rule. And that's never leave your equipment alone. That's just the common rule. There is no question about it. No why, what for. Never leave your equipment unattended at any time. That's important. Because if you do, bad things may happen. Having said that, let's start at the beginning. So imagine you go on a trip. What you need to do first is check the legislation of the country and also the stability, safety of the country. Because there may, um, there may be countries where it's a high risk that your equipment may get stolen or that certain additional controls while entering the country um, may be there. Um, so just be aware of that and travel and pack your equipment based on this. A very good trick for that is the uh, protection against evil made attack I'll show in the next slide. And always be aware that even a short time of unattended devices could lead to dangerous situations. There are tools like, for example, the rubber ducky attack, um, where you have a huge mass of keystrokes, which can be transferred to a device in order to conduct any kind of attacks. The evil made attack, um, as the name says, um, some third person um, who is not authorized gets access to your computer, for example, turns it on and does bad things about it. Um, there is a tool um, developed uh, by a colleague of mine, which uses uh, the smart data in order to identify if a device was powered on probably while you were not um, having it uh, on your side. So think about that, the tool is free and that's a very nice and easy first step into the field of um, yeah, securing your devices. When you're on the road, of course, there are many, many things you have with you. Let's start with your pocket. In your pocket, you have tons of cards probably for payment, for identification, from your employer, from your hotel room even. And many of these cards nowadays has some kind of RF functionalities like RFID, certain NFC types and so on. And of course, there are many, many threats about that. No time to really list all of them. So think about your cards and get protection for it. Like there are some shields or even pockets to put them in to make it unavailable for third parties to easily read them out and use this data probably against you. Going further, there's of course more um, wireless tools you may have with you. You may have a mouse, you may have even a keyboard with you. And of course, when it's wireless, there may be certain kind of attacks which could potentially um, be done like key checking, key sniffing. So record the transmission from your wireless device or even inject commands in the communication channel. So always check that your devices you have, if they're wireless, that they're not vulnerable to these kind of attacks. And also within cables, like shown here on the picture, there may be certain manipulations that RF chips are implanted. So you're simply not aware of that. A very famous example of that are the OMG cables, for example, um, which has quite extensive functionality that attackers can get remote access through that cable on certain devices. But of course, also think always about a simple power adapter because that device is big enough that there could be anything inside it. What you can do to protect yourself is, of course, don't trust um, cables, equipment from third party you don't know. And you can also use tools, for example, like the USB condom, which simply cuts off the data transmission functionalities and only allows uh, the power functionality when you, for example, want to charge your phone. These are very basic examples, but very effective in the end. 
So imagine you get to your room at the hotel. What's the first thing you want to do? And you should do. It's put out the do not disturb sign. Of course, that's not super advanced. It's just a sign. But to be honest, it can show, first of all, that you may be in the room, which is already something Yeah, people may not easily enter your room then. And also, you're, the staff of the hotel, for example, may not enter just randomly. So that's very basic thing. And let's be honest, if you just stay in this hotel room for one or two nights, do you really need a cleaning for that? I mean, come on. While you're in the room, um, check your environment. The first and very nice thing uh, many people probably know from a crime series and crime shows on TV are so-called two-way mirrors. Go into the bathroom, there probably you have a mirror and check if it's maybe a two-way mirror. Um, this example with the fingertip is of course not 100%. You can also knock against the, uh, the mirror and if there's some kind of hollow sound, it may also indicate that it's probably a two-way mirror. Um, it's very simple, um, but check that just to be sure. And while you're already in the bathroom room, um, there is something more you can do there. You can do very sensitive communication because one thing to fight against audio bugs is white noise. Uh, white noise is equally distributed noise over the frequency spectrum. And a very natural source for that is uh, water. So just turn on the shower, for example. You don't have to stand under it, of course. And if you don't want uh, to use your bathroom for communication, of course, you can do it in other rooms as well. Then you may have an FM radio or even just call a certain website, which just randomly generates uh, white noise for you. But that audio box is probably not the only thing how audio uh, could be recorded by third parties. Um, I mean, voice is vibrations, basically. And in the room, you may have a lot of different uh, things which also receive the vibrations and start vibrating by themselves. And there are certain techniques, for example, against the window or even uh, light bulbs to read out the vibrations and turn it back into voice. So even remote third parties could theoretically uh, receive what you're talking about in your room. Having thought that, um, another thing are of course, um, video bugs. A simple trick uh, against hidden spy cameras, which are sadly nowadays quite easy and cheap as well. And it's also yeah, reported quite often that they're also used in uh, rented apartments and the like um, to ensure, of course, the um, security of the rooms. Um, there are these devices where you can abuse the reflection of the lenses of spy cameras in order to detect them. It's not super easy if you're not used to, um, but it's a very simple thing to do at first if you have such kind of device or you can build one by yourself. A bit more, I would not say advanced, but um, proper method as well is just turn off the light, uh, use a digital camera or your camera from your smartphone, which in many cases do not have infrared filters in place and try to find infrared sources in your room. Because a video recording is especially interesting when it's dark. So they use infrared uh, lights and sources in order to record and capture uh, what's uh, going on in the room. And you can use that to detect them. A bit more advanced and also may cost a bit is a third method I'd like to show you is thermal imaging. So there are adapters either for your smartphones or also standalone devices. They cost some amount of money, but it's really interesting because um, 
many or most of the electric devices, I mean, they generate heat uh, to a certain degree. And you can use these kind of thermal imaging uh, devices in order to spot if there are any hidden electronic devices in your hotel room. That's quite interesting and efficient. Um, good thing to try out at least. When you found um, some bug in this direction, what to do? Um, very easy is covering. Also things you're not sure about, where it's suspicious, but you cannot, for example, just uh, turn down the TV or whatever, just put stickers on it. Um, also, in some cases, it may be a legal question. So always have some tape or stickers with you. You can simply uh, put on the things we're suspicious about uh, to be a bit more sure on that side. Well, many devices nowadays are not always using super advanced and crazy radio frequency control systems, but many use simple Wi-Fi. So why not getting some um, yeah, standalone Wi-Fi tool um, like this one, just as an example, there are way more out there, but not for you to connect with your devices to the internet, but to use them to detect other hotspots and Wi-Fi devices. Um, you can use the MAC addresses, for example, and also the names uh, of hotspots in order to identify potential spy devices. And of course, legally, that's a question uh, in certain countries, you may also send out the auth packages to such kind of devices in order to just disconnect them. Um, bit tricky, but it's a quite interesting uh, area to play with and to think about because it's not that advanced and uh, expensive. In the end, these were just a few examples. They raised uh, the level of course to make it harder for an attacker um, to easily spy on you and observe what you're doing and talking about. But fundamentally, most of the things we mentioned here is the awareness. Be aware of your devices, your communication channels, your communication behavior, and your physical environment. Prepare your digital space at then presented before and it's that simple, encryption, 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 encryption. And on the other side, your physical space. Be aware of what's around you. Check for potential unwanted devices. In many cases, it is easy. You don't need a specialized, a specialized bag full of super expensive equipment. There are these small tricks to make it possible for you. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you had some nice um, takings from uh, this talks. Um, thanks also to Dan for uh, his side on the digital take. And if you like, we're here to chat with you, to answer your questions. Feel free to reach out uh, to us on Twitter. Um, let's talk about it. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Marco, and happy to answer all your questions. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.